not white, shit. It appears here. Okay. Uh, you stopped. should, yeah, yeah. You should not put the slides. No. Ah, right. The staff, are you changed to camp? Yeah, yeah, right. Now we change to. Right. One more minute, okay. one more minute, right. Yeah, people are coming now. Okay, right? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the second lecture goes at the blackboard and, um, and at least up to a certain extent. So last time, uh, we've been talking about the possible higher integrability of the gradient of solutions uh, of equations like this, where H is a general right-hand side. So the last time, we have considered the case H that belongs to W minus one P prime. That's the dual of uh, of this space, and in this case, solutions are energy solutions in the sense that you can find uh, uh, solutions which are in the natural uh, sublet space W1P. Okay, in this case, we want to consider, in this second lecture, we want to consider the case where H does not belong to the dual, and in this case, uh, the situation is very much open, as we have seen at the, at the end of the last lecture. At the end of the last lecture, we have seen that when H belongs to the dual, you can, in some sense, represent H as the divergence of something, uh, of a vector field in this form. And this vector field belongs to LQ for Q larger or equal than P. And then we have seen that the subdual case, uh, that this ensures that um, that this guy is in the dual of W1P, then you can find an energy solution and so forth. But when Q is uh, less than P, then this guy doesn't belong to the case, uh, to, the, to the dual of W1P, and the situation is very much open. The only result available is the one I told you by Vanitz, Bourdon, and Lewis that claims that uh, if Q is... Uh, less than p, but still larger than p minus epsilon, and epsilon is a universal number that doesn't depend on the solution, neither on the vector field, but just on the ellipticity constants, then you can provide a priori estimates. Of course, you would like to turn this epsilon into one, and to get uh, in uh, the result in the full range, q larger, strictly larger than p minus one, but this is a very difficult open problem that no one is able to touch at the moment. So in the right hand side, so when the right hand side is in divergence form and you have that F belongs to LQ and Q is just larger than P minus one, so you are not able to touch this problem. And so you want to consider other forms of right hand sides. And in this lecture, I'm going to consider the case, the, essentially the only case which is, uh, which is considerable up to now. And this is the case when the right hand side is not in divergence form and it's just a measure. In the, in the most general case, we shall consider a bounded open domain in Rn. N is larger or equal than two. And this is a, um, a Borel measure with finite total mass. So the measure has finite total mass. That's the case I'm going to consider. So in this case, we first have to understand what we mean by solution. So distributional solutions are as follows. 
So you formally integrate this guy and then integrate by parts. And then uh, you know that the distributional solution is such that this is satisfied for every choice of test function with compact support in omega. And uh, you see immediately that as A of the U, think for instance where A of the U is the purely P Laplacian operator, that is this guy, then A of the U grows as the U to the P minus one, modular constant of course, and then it is sufficient that to define, to give, to give sense to this equality, that U belongs to the space W1P minus one, so rather the W1P. So you can define distributional solutions starting, just starting from this space. Uh, this gives problems. And of course, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, uh, these aspects of the, of the theory of measure data problems. I'm just going to give a few glimpses of the problems that are arising here. Uh, but just let me tell you the following. The right hand side now does not belong to the to the, dual, uh, to the dual of W1P. Uh, for instance, it doesn't belong for general measure when P is strictly less than N. It belongs, it does when P is larger than N, but it doesn't, but it does not when P is less than N. And therefore, the first thing you want to wonder uh, is uh, how do you find a solution? Certainly, standard uh, minty broader monotonicity methods do not apply here because the right hand side is not in the dual. So uh, the existence and the basic regularity theory has been done by, has been given by, by Boccardo and Galois, Lucio Boccardo, who is in Rome, and Thierry Galois. And um, it goes in the rather natural way. So the first thing you do, you see that the right hand side is not in the dual, so you do consider a sequence of smoothing of the right hand side. So you consider a sequence of standard modifiers, uh, psi n, and then you smooth mu out, and then you consider the following approximating problems. Now you can easily solve these problems. You have a sequence of solutions. This sequence of solutions are in W1P, but of course they are not uniformly bounded in W1P. And um, then the real, uh, the real beef here is to prove that there's a convergence towards something. And in fact, what Boccardo and Galois are proving is that uh, these functions are strongly converging in W1P minus one, actually in something more, something uh, smaller than W1P minus one, and therefore, they can pass to the limit in the nonlinearity, and they can find at least one solution to this problem. Uh, solutions of these types are distributional solutions, but of course they are special because they, are, they have been selected via an approximation method, and therefore these solutions are called SOLA, solutions obtained by limiting approximations. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a joke here. There's a double meaning because Lucio Boccardo is from Rome. And in Rome, in the local dialect, Sola means something that you would like, okay, you, you start believing that it works, but at the end it does not. And uh, in fact, what is the, the problem with Sola? The problem is that they are not known to be unique. So you solve the problem, but you don't know if the solution is unique in that class. And in fact, finding a, a function space, uh, let's say a class where to uh, solve the, the Dirichlet problem in a, a unique way is a very hard, is a main open problem in the theory of measure data problems. And uh, so this is still open. In fact, why you have to consider SOLA, why you have to consider other types of solutions? You have to consider other types of solutions uh, because in general, distributional solutions are not unique, are not known to be unique. There are very old examples by Severin, uh, and these examples are telling you that um, um, so, uh, distributional solutions that are not in the natural energy space, so very weak solutions, are not unique in general. Uh, there have been many attempts to define classes where to solve uh, uniquely problems uh, in um, um, in, in, in the related class, but these attempts, uh, they uniformly fail. In fact, they have been considered so-called renormalized solutions, entropy solutions, SOLA, and, but no one 
uh, in no one of these classes, at, at least in special cases, you are able to prove uniqueness. Uh, in fact, there's a recent, a very interesting work by Kilpelein and Kuusi. That is a name that is going to pop up very often in the rest of the talk. And Tuola Kum. Okay, it's a Finnish name that I never, I'm never able to remember, but there's a third order. And then in this, uh, in this very interesting work, is a recent work on analyzing all linear, um, they prove that all these solutions are equivalent for uh, positive measures. This is a paper that tells you that all definitions are in this respect equally bad or equally good. It depends on the taste. Okay, so this is, uh, this is as far as the uniqueness uh, and the uh, solvability problem is concerned. And of course, uh, here you have to prove estimates. Here you have to prove estimates to pass to the limit. And this gives the first regularity theorem uh, by Boccardo and Galois. Theorem, Boccardo and Galois. And this tells that every solar belongs to the Machinkiewicz space the gradient of every solar belongs to the Machinkiewicz space n over n minus 1. Okay, now let me recall the definition of Machinkiewicz spaces. These are weak spaces uh, that, uh, that are the natural ones in order to treat measured data problems. Why? Because solutions to measured data problems are typically in these spaces and not only in Lebesgue spaces. Okay, this is the first result. Actually, the first result of Boccardo Galois was that uh, uh, these uh, belong to uh, uh, every space of such type. And then Boccardo Galois, uh, Pierre, Bengel, and Baskets. Uh, there's always a sixth order here in this list. They established the borderline result. And when, uh, while in the case P equals to N, this was done by Doltzmann, Ungern, Buller, and Muller. But let me recall the definition of matching cabbage space. So you are, you are in MQ, provided you do the following. You consider the level sets of the function, then you take the measure, you multiply by to the Q, you take the soup over lambda, and this soup is finite. So where does this definition, uh, where does this definition come from? Uh, it's very simple. Take, uh, for instance, F, which is initially in LQ. So you are prescribing essentially a decay of level sets. Okay, take uh, uh, F, which is in LQ. Then, of course, you can use Chebyshev inequality to bound this in the following way, trivially. Then you switch this guy here. And you see that if f belongs to LQ, then this belongs to MQ. So this is a space which is slightly larger than LQ. And the prototype of functions that are in this space are, in fact, functions of these types. These are essentially in uh, Ln over A. But they are, they are not, they are, this belongs to Machinkiewicz n over a, but uh, does not belong to L n over a. And since solutions of measure data problems, as we are going to see here, are of this type, then these are the right spaces in order to consider measure data problems and their optimal regularity. In fact, there's one thing that it is necessary to point out, and this is the following. Uh, this is the following. There is one case, essentially one non-trivial case, uh, when um, solutions are known to be unique, at least in this class. And this is the special case where the right-hand side of the operator is a Dirac concentrating at the origin. So this is the Dirac mass concentrating at the origin. In this case, uh, the unique solution is given by the following one. Uh, this is um, 1 over x to the n minus p over p minus 1 when uh, n is different than p. And then this is the usual log of x if p is equal to n. 
As you see, when p is equal to 2, this coincides with the usual Green's function. Otherwise, this is a function which is the so-called fundamental solution of this, uh, of this problem. And it's a fundamental solution, of course, not in the sense that uh, these, uh, uh, then you obtain the solutions of uh, non-homogeneous problems via convolution. It's just called by fundamental solution to keep the, to keep the terminology, I mean. And this is the unique solution of this problem. This is one of the very few cases where you can prove that there's a unique solution in the, for a measure data problem. Of course, what's the maximal regularity in terms of integrability of the gradient of this solution? This is precisely this one. And so this result tells you that the result, that the original result of these people uh, is, is sharp. You cannot get better. Of course, also Boccardo and Galloway, they prove uh, the extended basic Calderon-Zygmunt theory for this problem, and they prove that if mu belongs now, it's not just a measure, but it belongs to LQ, and Q is uh, less than P star prime, so the conjugate of the Sobolev exponent, which is, uh, if I remember correctly, this guy, then the gradient to the P minus 1 belongs where you expect it to be n minus q. And this is the standard calderon zygmunt theory. So why, okay, let me, uh, let me remind you that if p is equal to 2, this is the standard calderon zygmunt theory. Why this is dimensionally correct? Because you're essentially doing the following a dimensional analysis type consideration. And, uh, and uh, it's important to keep in mind this approach uh, uh, for the following. Uh, so this is now in LQ, okay? Okay, what is the size of this guy? The size of this guy is the U to the P minus one, of course. So these are the derivatives of this guy. Now, if the derivatives are in LQ, then the guy by Sobolev embedding belongs essentially where it is expected to be. And this is the result. Because by Fourier analysis, inverting elliptic operators means that you are applying uh, Sobolev embedding convolutions via risk potentials and whatever. So dimensionally speaking, this is the right result. And this is the best result as far as the integrability of the gradient is concerned. So this is the basic calderon zygmunt theory. So this is the basic, basic CZ theory for measure data. Now, of course, uh, if you look at the operator, if you're looking at the, at, the, at the equation you're going to consider, you see that the equation is a second order equation. And formally, this equation prescribes that the derivatives of these guys that are in turn derivatives belong to a certain LP space. So the order of the operator is a second one, so you would expect results on second derivatives of the solutions. These are, in fact, called strong solutions. And uh, th this result, the basic result, just tells you about the integrability of the gradient. Now you would like to know some higher regularity result. And uh, let's see what is going to happen now for measure data problems. For measure data problems. What do you have? For measure data problems, if you do consider the very simple case of Laplacian being in L1, so when the right hand side is in L1 function, then this is not true. In general, this doesn't belong to W11 even locally. So this is the standard borderline critical case where you cannot prove that, the, that there are second derivatives. This, of course, happens when the right hand side is in L1. Okay, so everything seems to be lost in the case of measure data. And, uh, but, uh, okay, now uh, I would like to see a gap. I would like to make you observe a gap. Uh, so you have a second order equation. You have everything on the gradient as it could be differentiable by Sobolev embedding, but you do not have further higher derivatives. So uh, um, uh, you immediately see that you cannot have second derivatives by classical examples. So it seems that everything is lost. Uh, actually, almost nothing is lost if you do consider derivatives in another way. And you do introduce fractional Sobolev spaces. OK, what are fractional Sobolev spaces? Fractional Sobolev spaces are functions that are in L gamma. 
and such that the derivatives of order s are in L gamma, where s is between 0 and 1. So what does this mean? You do consider uh, objects of this type. So you want to measure the oscillations of f using the gamma norm in L gamma against the blow up of a kernel like this. If this guy is finite, you say that this function is in W S gamma. So this must be thought as a sort of uh, S derivative in L gamma. In fact, it scales like, uh, like this. If you make scaling by radii, the usual scaling you're doing elliptic regularity, they scale exactly as they would be as derivatives. OK. Now, the point is that if you do consider these guys, then you can fill the gap in the theory, and you can go to the maximal calderon zygmunt theory for measure that. So just to, be, just, to be, uh, just to start for the sake of simplicity, let me first consider the case p equals to 2. Because here, the problem I would like to recall you is not the fact that the, the equation is degenerate. This is a further problem. The first problem is that the equation is nonlinear. OK, the first result. Uh, in this direction is due by me, is published on Analigi Pisa in uh, 07, and tells that if you cannot be here, you are almost there. So this means that for every solar, for every epsilon larger than zero. So you are not in W11, but you are almost there. And uh, OK, the proof of this result is very non-trivial. It involves uh, some sort of nonlinear uh, okay, uh, non atomic characterization, um, nonlinear non decomposition via, um, I mean, it's difficult to describe. If you go to, to the um, classical uh, characterization of, uh, of Sobolev functions, uh, you see that there's a characterization via uh, decomposition of, uh, of, uh, in atoms, and these atoms are harmonic functions. Here you do a nonlinear decompositions where the atoms are solutions of nonlinear equations and you do some local little root Pelly in space decomposition. But uh, anyway, um, you are there. You can get, you cannot be here, but you're almost there. Okay, what happens for the case p larger than 2? I will restrict to this case because it's easier. There are also results for p less than 2, but these are more difficult. So these are introducing lectures. So it's not the case, it's not the case to cover all the material. Okay, um, let me go back to the fundamental solution, which is this guy. And let me, uh, let's compute the gradient. The gradient. Uh, of the fundamental solution is uh, bounded uh, by, by this guy. And then you see, you want to know, for instance, using uh, gamma equals to p minus 1, because this is the natural exponent coming up for, uh, coming up for measured data, where in which Sobolev space you are here. And then the Sobolev space, given by the fundamental solution, is this one. This locally belong belongs to this Sobolev space. This Sobolev space is sharp. Why? You immediately see that you cannot put epsilon equal to 0 here. OK, you immediately see that you cannot put epsilon equal to 0 when p is equal to 2, because otherwise you are in w11, and you are not even in the case of the Laplacian. But you can never put epsilon equal to 0. Why? Because Sobolev space, fractional Sobolev space, have their own, uh, their own embeddings. And the embedding is the following. S gamma embeds into n gamma, n minus S gamma. So let me compute the embedding when epsilon is equal to 0. So you would be in n, p minus 1, S times gamma is now p and minus 1, and p minus 1 simplifies. So you would be here. And in fact, you are not there, because this would tell you that this would belong to this one, while it is not. DGP just belongs to Marcinkiewicz. So the failure behind this epsilon there's the gap between Marcinkiewicz and uh, Lebesgue spaces. So in some sense, if you use uh, if you, so this is the best space you can be. 
This is the best place you can be. And in fact, the theorem that it's in the same, uh, it's in the same uh, paper is the following one, that for every solution, you are where you expect to be. And this is, in some sense, the, the maximal uh, regularity for measure data problems. Because it, uh, it upgrades the theory from gradient integrability to maximal gradient differentiability, at least using the known spaces. OK, this is uh, as far as is, uh, it is known about measure data problems and right hand sides that are not in the dual. And the theory stops here, because uh, up to uh, a few refinements of these results, these are the basic, uh, these are the basic facts. So the basic calderon sigmund theory is uh, around the beginning of the 90s, and this is by Boccardo and Galois, and then the maximal theory is essentially given by this, this theory, which is more recent. Uh, and this gives the, the, optimal, the optimal differentiability for solutions to measure data problems. OK, now let me switch to the other part of the talk, and uh, let me go back to potentials. Uh, let me go back to potentials. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it is time to switch to slides. Uh, I think we can go to the slides, because then the presentation becomes faster, and there will be more results. This, will, uh, this was more, more suited to, to be given at the blackboard. Oops. So where's the remote control? Yeah, thanks. Uh, OK, these are the previous slides. It's pretty fast. Huh? OK, now, is it appearing? No. OK, now let me recall uh, two basic formulas. Uh, we have seen that in the case uh, of the Poisson equation, uh, you can represent solutions uh, via convolutions with the usual Green's function. The Green's function, let, let me remind you, is given by the following. And um, if you now take a few consequences, now not looking at second derivatives, but just looking at u, at, at the gradient of u, then you get the following one. First, u can be bounded by i2, which is the, uh, the, RIS, the RIS kernel, the RIS operator, the fractional RIS operator. And then the gradient can be bounded by this other uh, RIS operator. So let me write down these formulas here everywhere, because they will be very important in the rest. So this is i1 of mu x, and this is du less than or equal, modular constant, of course, i2 of x. And let me recall that i beta of mu is, in this case, defined as the integration over the whole Rn, the mu total variation. OK, actually, this is the. Um, risk potential with the, the, re, the real risk potential is, is without total variation. Let me put the total variation to be consistent with the next, uh, with the next results. And this is simply this guy. When beta is, of course, larger than 0. And that's it. So one is two are Thank you very much. This would have been critical. <laughs> OK, um, then what can we say? OK, first of all, these are operators that are defined in the whole Rn. And I'm going to consider problems that are local problems, so in bounded domains. So let me localize the operators. So we introduce the so-called uh, truncated risk potentials that are given by these operators. And they are just another way of writing down the same thing, because they are locally bounded by the full risk potential operator. In some sense, you, inst you, you put yourself at a point and you reverse the integration. Instead of integrating over the whole Rn, then what you do, you just integrate on the ball 
of radius uh, r and center x. And this is, of course, uh, the truncated Ries operator. In some sense, is it? The truncated Ries operator. So it's just another way of writing down the Ries potential. And from now on, for us, the Ries potentials are precisely these objects. You do not lose any generality in considering these objects. You even decrease the right hand side. OK, and now you would like to see analogs of these two formulas uh, for uh, nonlinear equations and for possibly the generator operators. But let me, let me remind you that since these formulas are consequences of representation formulas, then the whole beef here is primarily to pass from linear to nonlinear and then to eventually consider um, uh, the generator the generate operators. Both steps are important, uh, but the real first one is to show that things that are apparently very linked to linearity of problems actually hold for nonlinear ones. Okay. Um, okay, the point is the following one. If you do consider the P-Laplacian, for sure you cannot get these formulas. Why? Because the P-Laplacian operator have a different scaling, and uh, uh, if you have estimates, estimates must respect the scaling of the, of the equation. What is the scaling of the equation of the P-Laplacian when P is different than 2? Well, you immediately see that if you multiply U by a constant, which is C to the 1 over P minus 1, then this new function solves this equation. Because, of course, the, right, the left-hand side scales as p minus 1 with respect to multiplication. The, uh, uh, the, the right-hand side scales linearly, so therefore, it is clear that such an estimate, such estimates cannot hold. Because they do not respect the scaling of the equation. If this estimate would hold, then you would, uh, you would uh, apply the same thing to c times u to this guy, and then every solution would be zero. So these estimates cannot hold as long as p is larger than 2, is strictly larger than 2. And therefore, the orthodoxy of nonlinear potential theory is to replace Ries potentials by so-called Wolf potentials. Wolf potentials are these operators, and despite their names, they were first introduced and studied by Yaving and Mazia in, this, in a fundamental paper from 72, I guess. Uh, how do you obtain Wolf potentials? You just consider the kernel the risk kernel, and you incorporate the, uh, the, the scaling deficit of the equation. So what is the scaling deficit of the equation? Look at the scaling. It's c to the 1 over p minus 1. And therefore, you incorporate this in the kernel. And only after this procedure, you can hope for getting um, a, a real analog of these formulas when p is larger than 2. OK, now the point is that can you really get it? And the answer is yes. And this is a fundamental theorem by Kilperlein and Mali. This is a real fundamental theorem because this tells you that you can pointwise bound u by the booth potential W1p plus, of course, a localizing term. The localizing term must be there. Why? Because the, what is the Wolf potential there? The Wolf potential uh, is this guy. When r goes to 0, if this is finite, this goes to 0 because it's an integral. And therefore, you must have. Uh, u less than or equal than u, because you are, suppose you are in a Lipic point, and therefore it's OK. Otherwise, if u is globally integrable, you let r go to plus infinity, this guy disappears, and you get u less than or equal than this guy. For p less than equals to 2, this, goes back, this gives back the first estimate in the linear case. This is the first estimate in the linear case. OK. Um, and let me tell you that the result is new even for p equals to 2. Because for p equals to 2, there is no representation formula. So the result is a breakthrough, is a breakthrough already in the case p equals to 2. And then, of course, the, the regularity theory for u is invariant for p equals to 2 and uh, p different than 2, because it's essentially based on the Georges theory, which is uh, already in the linear case a purely a linear proof. And. Um, OK, actually, Kilperang and Mali proved this for positive measures. Uh, uh, a proof for general measures have been, has been given uh, subsequently by Duzer and myself. Um, 
Can you do better? You cannot do better because uh, actually when uh, mu is positive and u is positive by maximum principle, then you can put the Wolf potentials uh, also from below. And therefore you cannot replace this Wolf potential W1P whatsoever with any other potential. So the estimate is perfect, it's really perfect. So the, the, uh, the Wolf potentials are very basic objects in nonlinear potential theory because they replace uh, the risk potentials everywhere. For instance, if you want to study fine properties of solutions, fine properties of general W1P functions, Wiener criterion uh, and whatsoever, they replace uniformly risk potentials everywhere and they give essentially the same results. And so the orthodoxy of nonlinear potential theory is that uh, anywhere you see a risk potential, replace it, it by, a wolf, by the, the natural wolf potential. Okay, and now we go, we go uh, to this other case, which is the most uh, tempting one, because now you have uh, the gradient estimate. Okay, the, uh, the result for the gradient remained an open problem since the, since the work of, uh, of uh, Kilpelangen and Mali. It remained an open problem uh, because it was uh, not reachable with the same methods, and also because a few people were not convinced that it would work. For instance, uh, it is clear that this estimate fails for the gradient. You can have a flat gradient, some zones, uh, and then you, you do not get the estimate. Essentially because this estimate is linked to the maximum principle that doesn't hold for the gradient. And so this remained an open problem, and, um, uh, and, uh, and let's see what, it, what it's true. But before going on, let me tell you that estimates of this type, they really unify the theory. Why? Because essentially the behavior of Wolf potentials is known. The behavior of Wolf potentials is known because by a fundamental inequality of having a Mazia, you can point twice bound, and this is actually a, a a perfect equivalence when p is, uh, uh, is larger than 2, you can pointwise bound the Wolf potential via a nonlinear iteration of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of risk potentials. Uh, you see 1 over p must appear somewhere because it dictates the scaling of the equation, but otherwise you can perfectly control Wolf potentials by, uh, by um, uh, risk potentials. Let me restate this formula when beta is equal to 1, this formula tells that you can pointwise bound the Wolf potential by the following nonlinear iteration of uh, uh, risk potentials. This is called V1 mu, and this is called having Mazia potential. Uh, it is really, I mean, uh, all these booth potentials were essentially introduced and studied before by having a Mazia. Okay, therefore, they unify the theory. For instance, if you want to get the results of Boccardo and Galois, they follow by this estimate, because you, you know that W1 mu belongs to Machinkiewicz, uh, to the right Machinkiewicz space, and therefore also U does. So everything follows from there. Okay, and now we go back, uh, we go back to, the, 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 to this open problem uh, of, um, that, uh, that started having the work of, after the work of, uh, of Kilpelangen and Mali. So, and uh, now you want to extend this to the gradient level. You want to upgrade to the le gradient level. And uh, of course, you first attack the case P equals to two because you want to know if things work there. So in the case P equals to 2, the uh, assumptions are very simple. The first, I get the, the first derivatives are, are, oh, actually there's a typo here. Instead of Z, you have to put just a constant. Let's put L. And then electricity is like the one of the Poisson equation. Um, and the real task is really passing from linear to nonlinear problems uh, because the point is that there are no representation formulas here. And, uh, in the case P larger than 2, we still consider the following ones that generalize the P-Laplacian growth and ellipticity properties. Okay, and then the first result was obtained by me a few years ago, actually in 2008, then uh, there's a delay in publication, of course, and the first result tells you essentially what you want to have, that you can bound pointwise the gradient via the risk potentials, plus the usual localizing term that is unavoidable, because when you R goes to zero, then you get gradient on both on both sides. 
And uh, of course, this is what I was telling you, if you belong to W11 over Rn and you are in the whole Rn, then uh, the usual representation formula that holds for the Poisson equation holds for any general quasi-linear equation. And uh, the proof involves, uh, uh, okay, I will give a sketch of the proof in the third lecture of this. And um, uh, because it involves also a fractional de Georgi's iteration and analysis in fractional subtler spaces that uh, were was simultaneous uh, to some techniques, to some regularity techniques develop, developed by Caffarelli and uh, other people in the, in the non-local operators theory. Actually, I was not aware of that. And, uh, okay, what happens when P is larger than two? When P is larger than two, of course, you want to replace risk potentials with both potentials. And uh, that's what we started doing uh, with, uh, with my former collaborator, um, uh, Duther, and, uh, uh, and this, is the, this is the result that we got. That for the P Laplacian operator, then the gradient can be bounded by this Wolf potential, which is the natural, from the dimensional analysis viewpoint, operator that replaces the risk potential. And in fact, when P is equal to two, you go back to the, to the previous result. So apparently the problem was solved because you have risk potentials when p is equal to two, wolf potentials when p is larger than two, and then you're happy with that. And now there's a twist because uh, we had further suspects. This is the, the point where this guy, Tuomo Kusi from Helsinki, comes into the play. And uh, from now on, almost all the results are obtained in collaborations with him. He's, I think, one of the best uh, experts worldwide in linear PDs, at least from each generation. He's not very well known yet, but I guess he's, he's going to, be, uh, to become very famous soon. And, uh, okay, let's see what happens. So that's the twist. Okay, let me consider this, uh, this operator, and let me do the following very brave uh, heuristic argument. The following very brave heuristic argument is that uh, you do consider this equation, and then there are two, essentially two viewpoints you can use by looking at this equation. The first one is the usual one. This is a nonlinear equation uh, of you, in you. But then you can say this is a linear equation in a nonlinear quantity involving the gradient. And so you decouple this equation in the following system. That's what you're doing. Now, if you look at this problem in this way, and you are brave enough that you can solve this simultaneously in the way you look, you see that you expect now linear estimates on this quantity because inverting this problem means using a risk potential. So you would like uh, to have something like uh, du to the p minus one less than or equal than i1 or a related equivalent operator, I mean a, uh, an operator with a related equivalent singularity of the right hand side mu. Of course, you cannot do directly in this way. Why? Because you can always solve this guy, but this guy has infinitely many solutions, uh, and no one tells you that one of these is of the type you'll, you look for. That's what I was saying. So you expect, rather than uh, a Wolf potential estimate for du, a risk potential for du to the p minus one. So this appears to be, uh, in some sense, uh, heretical from the point of view of nonlinear potential theory because P Laplacians, they always work hand in hand with Wolf potentials. It, and in fact, when I uh, talked about this problem, a few people were laughing. Uh, not everybody, for instance, Tuomo was not laughing because he had a good insight. And in fact, uh, the result was true. And this is a very surprising result uh, because this completely linearized the theory of the P Laplacian. Now, until if you are looking for gradient estimates for the P Laplacian, they are exactly uh, as the gradient estimates for the Poisson equation. So there's no difference between general, possibly the generate quasi-linear equation and the most simple equation you can consider, that's the Poisson equation. As a corollary, all the results, for instance, for measured, from, for measured data, also all the results of uh, people working on measured data, 
uh, on symmetrization or um, all the results essentially for these equations that involve several different techniques because you can be below the duality exponent, above the duality exponents in all these cases. Uh, for instance, the symmetrization results of Talenti and uh, of Boccardo Galloway with respect to the integrability of the gradient, they follow now because you just don't look at the equation anymore, you just look at the risk potential. And uh, this was, um, I mean, I was not, okay, we were rather sure that, uh, that it worked. Uh, all the other people were absolutely sure that it didn't work, but at the end it worked. Uh, but the result is very rewarding because it, it is very unifying. And for instance, uh, once again, when u uh, belongs to W1p minus 1, then you can uh, let capital I to plus infinity, the localizing term disappears, and you get this striking estimate that tells you that for the P Laplacian, uh, everything works as the Poisson equation. So this is the right estimate, and uh, this is just the estimate. Okay, uh, so there's no difference between Poisson and P Laplace. Um, and of course, also many delicate uh, borderline cases are now following, because there are cases for which that are strictly in between the methods for uh, uh, for dual for I mean, for energy solutions and non-energy solutions, and therefore you are a bit. Uh, um, the techniques do not meet there, but now you bypass everything and they just now follow as a corollary of the estimate. Okay, there's even a more surprising fact. Uh, let, me, let me recall you the definition of this risk potential. The definition of this risk potential is the following one. This is the truncated risk potential. So you integrate the total variation against the higher measure. And you see that, for instance, uh, you have immediately uh, a solution to a very long-standing open problem. You want to know the, the best space uh, where the gradient is bounded for the P Laplacian with respect to the right-hand side. Then you just prescribe that the, right -hand that the risk potential is finite, and then you have the sharp result immediately. And of course, since you know when the risk potential is finite, for instance, you are in certain Lorentz spaces and blah, blah, then everything is, uh, uh, goes back to the Poisson equation. Now, if this guy is finite, of course, you can let r goes to zero, and by the absolute continuity of the integral, this goes to zero. Now, imagine that this guy goes to zero uniformly with respect to x. So there's no uniform concentration of the measure. Then this implies the continuity of the gradient. This is also known for the Poisson equation, but now it holds for the P Laplacian equation. And this gives uh, uh, an even more striking result because, uh, uh, because now you're looking for the oscillations of the gradient. You can think that the previous one works because you're looking at how the gradient is large, but now you're looking at the smallness, possibly smallness of the oscillation of the gradient, and now it still provides information. Okay, uh, this is the general result, and let's see a few corollaries, a few worth uh, mentioning corollaries of this result. And of course, this tells you that once again, there's no difference between regularity theory for the Laplacian and for the P Laplacian uh, equation, uh, at least to C C1 alpha. In particular, we have a fully analog of, the, of a result of, uh, of a classical result in linear potential in linear potential theory. You want to know when the uh, when Mm, a point is a Lebesgue point, so you want to stu study the fine properties of solutions and of their gradients, uh, and then you know that this happens precisely when the risk potential is finite. Uh, this is a, another classical result in linear potential theory that now finds a perfect counterpart in this setting. Okay, now let me go back to a fundamental famous theorem of Stein that tells you the following. You know, everybody knows, that uh, when the gradient uh, belongs to ln plus something, uh, then this implies that V is elder continuous. And alpha is uh, one minus, uh, um, is this guy. But now, uh, when epsilon goes to zero, you want to f know the larger space that still allows for a gradient continuity. This is the Lorentz space. This is a famous theorem of Stein. 
uh, law in space is that uh, is uh, is defined prescribing such a decay of level sets is an interpolation space. It can be characterized via rearrangements, blah blah. But this is the space. Okay, another way of uh, essentially equivalent stating the same theorem is that uh, Laplacian of U belongs to ln one tells that the gradient is continuous. This is the previous result plus standard calderon zygmunt theory because these are interpolation spaces. So there are two equivalent ways of uh, looking at Stein's theorem. These are borderline cases. Okay, so Stein's theorem is that Laplacian belongs to ln one then you know that uh, the gradient is continuous. Um, an example of functions in uh, Lorentz spaces are these ones. Instead of the powers, you go for the logs. That's it. So the second index uh, encodes, codifies the logs. Corollary, the same holds for the p Laplacian. If the right-hand side belongs to ln1, then the gradient is continuous, no matter the nonlinearity of the problem. Proof, if the right-hand side belongs to ln1, then the, it is immediate, almost immediate, to prove that the risk potential goes to zero uniformly with respect to x. And therefore, you can use the previous result. This is the effect of Lorentz space. So you have a, a nonlinear Stein's theorem. Um, this one? Yeah. It's the right one. I checked. <laughs> Uh, can I go on? Right. Uh, OK, uh, with another method, by the way, not using potentials, we extended this to system recently. So we have a fully nonlinear Stein's theorem for the P Laplacian system. If you have the P Laplacian system and the right hand side, they are vector filled with the Lorentz space entries, then uh, components, uh, then uh, you can get that the U is continuous. Uh, uh, even more uh, surprisingly, but actually with a much simpler proof, we extended this recently to fully nonlinear equations with, in collaboration with Totti Dascalopoulos from Columbia. And you have a fully nonlinear equation, the right hand side belongs to ln 1, and then the gradient is continuous. Uh, once again, it is continuous. Uh, this is the, once again the borderline result of, um, of results of Tudinger and Caffarelli that were telling you that if f belongs to a length plus something, then uh, du is in C0 alpha. That's the Sobolev uh, space theory. I think that you can find a fully account of this, uh, of this result in your book, right, Javier? This is, uh, I think, chapter five or six, I guess, you know, in your book. And uh, of course, ln plus something, uh, uh, it's strictly contained in ln1. Um, ah, there's also, actually, there are, this is also related to very interesting results, uh, recent results by Eduardo, that, are, uh, that he proves, I think, the log Lipschitz continuity when the right-hand side is in BMO or whatever. Also, borderline, very borderline cases, uh, interesting cases, also with a very interesting proof. And uh, finally, I would like to mention that this is a general fact. Uh, the fact that you can find uh, linear potential estimates for nonlinear problems is a general fact. And for instance, let me consider this very general class of operators that extend in the most general possible way uh, the P Laplacian operators. Uh, you can consider degeneracy like this, uh, where you put uh, a uniform ellipticity condition like this. So this is not a minimal surface type, but it catches up other types of growth conditions. In particular, when g is equal to t uh, to the p minus 1, uh, you go back to the p Laplacian. Uh, they have been considered by Lieberman, and they are the most general conditions ensuring that uh, the standard theory of uh, the George and Ash Moser can be worked out as far as the regularity of u and of the gradient is concerned. And then there's a very nice theorem of Baroni that tells you that the same result still holds for these operators. So this is a very general phenomenon. And it's a general phenomenon essentially linked to the, to the heuristic argument I was giving you. You decompose the problem in a linear problem, and you see that now the, the gradient is, is a solution of, uh, of, uh, of the equation. Um, um, do we have still one minute? Just to explain one thing, uh, why? So you, it, it might seem strange that uh, when you get estimates for Wolf potentials, uh, you get, uh, you get uh, 
uh, when, you get, when you want to have estimates for u, you get both potentials. When you want to have estimates for the gradient, uh, you get, uh, get risk potentials. So why risk potentials and not Wolf potentials? Or why Wolf potentials and not risk potentials? Uh, it's very simple. OK, uh, uh, okay. Why, risk, uh, why risk potentials are there for the gradient? It is clear, because uh, you look, at, uh, you look at, this, at this heuristic argument. That is, the equation is a nonlinear equation in the gradient, but is also a linear equation in a nonlinear vector field of the gradient. So let's see why a similar viewpoint doesn't hold for you. OK, this is, purely heuristic, uh, this is a purely heuristic argument, and it's a purely dimensional analysis. So it, uh, mathematically speaking, from a rigorous viewpoint, it makes no sense, but tells you the right track. OK, let's try to invert uh, this operator via integrations. Uh, and remember, please, that uh, uh, risk potentials are integrations. Okay, you have this one. So you want to get rid of the divergence, uh, and you apply I1, because I1 is an integration of order one, and it cancels with the divergence. Zack. Okay? And now, what is this guy? This guy is like uh, du to the p minus one. So now we are back to the previous estimate. So let's get rid of uh, p minus one. p minus one. And now, and now you see that you do not have uh, u, but you have still the gradient. So you still need another integration. And to get rid of this integration, you need another first order integration. To get rid of this gradient, you need another first order integration. So another is potential type operator. So let's apply. And then you get that u, i1 cancels with the gradient. u can be bounded by this guy. Surprise, surprise, what is this guy? This is the having mazia potential that for p larger than 2, it's perfectly equivalent to the Wolf potential. So uh, you can read the equation as a linear equation in a nonlinear vector field of the gradient, but there's no way to do the same thing for u. The equation is never linear in a nonlinear quantity of u. Why? Because there's always a, a further integration to do. This further integration gives you a bu and, uh, the Havi mazia potential, and it is essentially ultimately responsible for the appearance of Wolf potentials as the, the best possible uh, potentials you might consider under these conditions. And uh, I think that the, with the theorem of uh, Bayong, it's, uh, it's enough. I can go on with the next time. And this is the usual picture of Serena that I put at the end of every talk. It's a, a friend of mine who is an artist working in Venice. OK, thank you very much for the attention. <laughs>